Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. We have uh, only uh, 10 minutes. <laughs> if we have a uh, uh, you know, uh, coffee break. Uh, so uh, just uh, let's collect a question. Uh, please uh, try to make a uh, no, quick and question. And OK, we have a question. OK, go ahead. Um, uh, Thanks to both speakers. Very interesting papers. Glenn, a few questions. Um, the first is this. China is rerouting its finance and moving from U.S. Treasury bonds into what Varoufakis calls a global surplus recycling mechanism of an entirely different sort, namely the One Belt, One Road projects, on an enormous scale. So uh, this rerouting is already taking uh, place. Related question. Wall Street and other financial industries seek yield for their pension funds, for etc., from emerging economies because in the advanced economies, very low low growth uh, rate, yield is very limited. It is so small that only Warren Buffett can find it. Um, so there is a structural relationship, Western finance emerging economies, if emerging economies reroute their funds to sovereign wealth funds operating outside the circuit of Wall Street and London, then the whole global dance card is going to change, and it's changing already, and China plays a major part in that. Um, so I would say your question about China, uh, two, no, two, two quick notes. Finance in which role the outflow is now changing, not the inflow. Only 2% financial um, foreign finance in the Shanghai stock market. And then which parts of Asia? South Asia, very different. A lot of Wall Street. South East Asia, quite different than East Asia. Pardon so long. Oh, uh, a uh, question to approve with some more. And uh, my uh, question is, uh, when you said the financial financialization, I suppose the uh, bank or uh, banking sector and uh, so uh, security market sector both uh, uh, behaving a different principle. And uh, the main uh, phenomenon uh, which we recently observed is the increasing power of the security-based uh, institution uh, rather than bank sector, and also a banking sector moved to uh, security businesses. So uh, in this sense, the uh, financialization may have this kind of a shift from banks to uh, security uh, basis activities. So, uh, this point uh, would be appropriate, Chris, so, uh, in your uh, idea or not? So that's like my question. OK. Tobias. I, I have a question, or maybe more sort of remarks for uh, to Nanlin. Uh, the first is I had the impression, maybe this is also inter somewhat due to time constraints, that you, you painted a picture of a m maybe too monolithic and homogeneous party state able to centrally manage the economy. As uh, you said, competition now plays a major role in the economy, but it also plays a role on the state level, meaning there's intrastate competition, there's competition between central state institutions. So think of all these fights that the Ministry of Finance, the National Development and Reform Commission, all these other players, people think of China and so on, they in, in, in reality have and fight over. And more importantly, central local relations and the kind of local competition that is so important for understanding the dynamics of the system. But my main point really refers to your concept of corruption. Because I, I was asking myself, if, if China is, in terms of corruption, rotten to the core, my question would then be, why is this economy having the biggest growth rates uh, in world history? So, I mean, on the political level, 
surely this, the corruption has all sorts of, of creates all sorts of problems, uh, political conflicts, increase in equality, and so on and so forth. But in terms of economics, wouldn't it be better to, to, to look for more differentiated concepts of than corruption? Because in my view, what happens or what happened for a long time in China, on the, especially on the local level, in these public-private growth alliances that have been so important for understanding China's growth, there was a kind of, let's say, productive cronyism leading to efficient investment in the real economy rather than only rent-seeking and the kind of harmful forms of corruption that I think you were talking about. Yeah? So maybe, maybe you can talk okay. a little bit more about th okay. this. Okay, uh, Professor Gary Hagel and then Sheffer. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just have a, a question about the relationship between the stories of the two panels in particular. Uh, you have the um, uh, new charismatic Xi uh, crushing or trying to crush all of these uh, oligarchs who have earned a lot of money in the uh, uh, process of Chinese development. And Glenn wondering, what are the prospects of uh, financialization uh, rooting itself into the uh, sphere of Asian capitalisms? I just wonder whether or not the two phenomena are related. I mean, we have <clears throat> in uh, the West, we have these rotten to the core, corrupt uh, billionaires that we just call private you know, uh, wealth creators. Uh, whereas in China, they're, they're billionaires who are part of the state apparatus. And so you could view Xi as kind of Bernie Sanders, uh, Occupy Wall Street, kind of in Chinese. So I just wonder if Glenn has any sense of um, the political contingencies uh, associated with the diffusion of these sorts of systems, or if you just view it as a sort of, you know, Foucauldian, faceless, uh, you know, acidic, acid-like systemic uh, process that undermines everything that's good and holy in the, uh, you know, non-market sphere, or whether or not these kinds of stories about um, uh, the sort of effort on the part of the Chinese state to uh, reform itself are related to questions of, um, uh, actual economic transformation. Okay, thank you. So last. Sheffer. Yeah. Mentioned in passing at the beginning of your talk uh, that property rights and democracy seem to be not essential uh, for capitalism, at least not for Chinese capitalism. And uh, so intuitively I thought at least property rights would be essential. So that I would like you to comment on that. And Glenn Morgan, uh, uh, this is a conceptual question, and I think nicely you yesterday kind of made a strong point for capitalism in the singular. And uh, if financialization is not happening in any strong way in China, Japan, and Korea for different reasons, then what does that mean for, you, for your more singular concept of capitalism? Isn't it then more that we would have to say, at least now, there are capitalisms, although the financialization is kind of pushing into China or the East Asia as well. But uh, since we don't know the outcome, you cannot say they will be successful. OK, uh, go ahead. This is, uh, you know, put together and answer the qu uh, questions. Yeah. Very good questions. So why? You know, to what extent corruption should be uh, would it uh, disrupt, in a sense, the growth of, uh, of China? I think that Xi Jinping is taking the risk. And uh, he's high priority. I don't think he's worrying about the, the growth rate, because he knows that uh, China is now slowing down. And there's very little he can do to reverse the trend. So, but the critical question for him is whether the party can be saved. So it's a political issue rather than an economic issue. And uh, so I think in his judgment that uh, if corruption continued, 
then the party's rule will be really challenged. <laughs> and uh, he could, and being a princeling, so I think that my, my interpretation, I think it's a, it's a, and he has enough trust in the extent of wealth and the drive of the economic growth. All of, I mean, it, they, if you just don't eliminate all the billionaires, Chinese are very rich, very rich, and the savings is tremendous. And they've eliminated, uh, you know, I think six million, 600 million people from the, uh, below the poverty line. So that in a sense that he has enough faith and trust in the overall growth. And so we, okay, <laughs> we may suffer a little bit, but uh, I want to save the party. Anyhow, that's my, my, uh, my second question quickly about the poverty rights. Uh, no, I, I think the poverty rights issue is not only relevant to China. It's uh, to all capitalism. Again, Hong Kong has been regarded as the capitalist state by Freeman, none other than Freeman. But Hong Kong, the land belongs to the city, even to this day. And in fact, some of the wealthy families try to argue that the state should not release more land for private development. It's very intriguing. You know, this, so I, I see, a, it's a Singapore, the same thing, and, and some other. It's a, it may be helpful if property becomes privatized after the capitalist development. Again, if you look at the British system, it's very different from the, 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 the mainland, the UK development, and all the colonial systems. And it's a, it's a remarkably different systems, but and that's the way, you know, anyhow. And so I, I, I think that we, we should pause about the linking at least property rights as a president of the capitalism. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worried about a DeSoto's effort because I'm in Latin America, like, let's privatize everything and then, 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 then we'll, I, I doubt that the, I, uh, the last 10 years that you haven't heard much about it. Democracy is the same thing as I mentioned. It comes after the capitalist development in England. You know, the voting rights of the women came very late and uh, the, the, in the United States, the, the women, uh, 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 I think it was, it was only in the 1920s, that they, and the blacks, after the Second World War, had the universal voting rights. Otherwise, the states could stop them. So that, in a sense, oh, so America was not a capitalist uh, state before that. So I, you know, it's a, it's a question mark. Yeah. Okay, Glenn Morgan. Yeah, well, thanks very much for, for those questions. Uh, in terms of, first of all, China rerouting out of the safe haven of the treasury bonds and uh, developing its own sovereign wealth funds and uh, engaging in uh, different ways to manage this huge overseas uh, surplus that it has developed. Um, I think that one of... I, I mean, I need to look at this more, but I, I still feel, as I talked about with regard to the, uh, the tax havens, that, uh, that in terms of the um, routing and the sort of uh, engagement with financial markets, that, this, that Wall Street and, and the City of London are still trying to, to capture this market and will be central to this. The, the, uh, there's, I think Professor Lin mentioned it about the UK and uh, the, uh, its role in, in trying to ensure that it is central to the internationalisation of the RMNIMV. Uh, the UK is still uh, very much trying to win that business in the European context and against, against Wall Street. So I think that, again, this, once these relationships become embedded and once power and knowledge to use the Foucauldian term, does become embedded in particular locations, then even you know, a, an alternative sort of 
model like China is going to use those. But uh, the degree to which this rerouting out the safe havens uh, will impact, I, I, I'm not sure. I still think that this that uh, Wall Street and, and City of London will be fighting hard to get as much of the as they can of their own NIMBY. Um, the increasing power of the security sector as opposed to retail banking, I mean, I think that, that reflects in places like uh, uh, Japan, sort of the savings rate and the need to invest and be smarter than just going for low, uh, low interest bearing accounts. So I think we can see that sort of development uh, again as, as a, an as empowering a certain form of financialization, but but the uh, but in comparison to the U.S., the range of funds and the riskiness of funds is much more constrained and controlled in the Japanese context. And uh, so, I don't think it's uh, it's going to lead to the same sorts of things as it as it did in in uh, in 2008 crisis. Uh, yeah, the, the, Gary's question about, on the one hand, the campaign rooting out corruption, and on the other hand, uh, the financialization uh, process, the existence of the tax havens, etc., as uh, uh, being a, as, as being a way to facilitate hiding money high and, and creating. Uh, and, and being essential to, to this corruption. I mean, I, I think that I don't want to say that this is a Foucauldian set of practices that is imposed, but that there is, I tried to say at the start, there's political contingency, it depends upon various actors, but there are certain embedded uh, sort of processes that have now been established in the world economy if those tax havens hadn't been there, if they'd been rooted out previously, what would the options have been for the Communist Party cadres for hiding their money, or for the uh, communi uh, for, for China actually uh, engaging, having this dual policy of, of sort of controlling how the renminbi yuan became internationalised? So, uh, you know. I'm, this question of corruption, which has come up a couple of times, and I guess uh, you know, if I had a question, it would be how how symbolic is the campaign against corruption? How how much is it politically directed, as opposed to how deep does it go? But anyway, I'm not supposed to ask questions, fellow panelists. Uh, and then finally, Wolf's question: the singular version of capitalism. If financialization is not impacting in East Asia. Uh, what does that do for my notion of there being a single version of capitalism? Well, firstly, you know, I, I think that there are areas where it is impacting, and maybe these are around China in particular, uh, but in other ways as well. But I think the, the other reason for maintaining the singular version of capitalism is the interconnectedness, that one can't exist without the other, and that the expansion of financial activities in the US and you know, the, my argument is that that was dependent upon Chinese uh, overseas investments in uh, US Treasury bonds and that in turn was dependent upon the uh, higher competitiveness of the Chinese in many manufacturing industries than, than in the US. So singular version of capitalism, yes, because these things are interconnected, but they're not the same everywhere by any means. That's why we have to have the plural version as well. So I want to hold to the singular and to the plural, and as the British say, have my cake and eat it. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, time to close. Uh, this is a keynote uh, uh, speech session. Uh, let's uh, give it, uh, Damon a big hand. Thank you. Uh, actually, so we start late.